Good morning, everyone. Anyone have any questions for me before I get started? Good morning, Amina. Okay, what's your question? Someone said they wanted to ask a question. Um, waiting for that. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Alex was marking questions wrong with mode. Okay. Um, I'll have to go in there and look at it. But um, to tell you the truth, I haven't had any reports from any of the other teachers. Usually, like, if something like that is wrong in the system, it'll con they'll contact me right away and let me know that there's a problem. We try to like to, you know, all, the whole team of teachers that's teaching MAT 1100, we always do that with each other if there's any kind of issue. But I'm going to reach out to the other teachers, find out if they had any issues with it. And whenever you do experience something like that, the best thing is to, do, is to take a screenshot so I know exactly on what question you encountered that problem. Because if there is anything wrong with it, it's likely that that was the only question that there was an issue with, if there's even anything wrong with it. But uh, did you take a screenshot when you encountered this problem? Because sometimes students, a lot of times students do that. Yes, no, maybe. Is there something you want to verbalize about why you think um, the questions were being marked wrong? What were you running into specifically? You can say it out loud because if it really was an issue. Did anyone else um, run into that problem? I think we should start right can, there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay. So it was questions with mode, but it was like if the number was only – repeated twice like only two times it would mark it as not correct unless the number was repeated three times it was really weird and you didn't happen to take a screenshot of that because that's not true anything no. you know if if the other problems if the other uh items in the set only occurred once each I mean, I'm imagining all the rest of the problem because you don't have a screenshot of the problem. But if every item was listed once and then there was one item that was listed twice, it would be the mode because that means that item is occurring more than all the rest of the items in the set. So yeah, I, I don't know if that's what you ran into. I mean, maybe there was more than one number in the because, you know, I'm not I'm not actually getting to see the problem. I'm, I'm just imagining all the rest of the elements of uh, what happened in that particular problem. You know, I'd, you know, it's like I need to look at the list to answer your question. Maybe there were other items in the set that also occurred twice. Yeah, like if it was a question that had three different modes, one number occurred two times, and then two more numbers occurred three times, it would say that the number that occurred three times were the mode instead of the right. one that was only two. Right. That is correct. It's whichever numbers, number or numbers ap appears the most times. So, oh, okay. you, yeah. So if you have, um, I mean, let me go to my doc cam and give an example. But if you have just verbally before I turn on the doc cam, if you do, like, let's say you have a set of numbers. And the number five occurs twice. And then you have the number seven that occurs three times. And you have the number nine that occurs three times. Seven and nine would be the mode. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, <clears throat> once you have a number that occurs three times, that guy that only appeared twice, he no longer counts. He's no longer in the running to be the winner. 
Mm, okay. The winner is the number that occurs the most times. And sometimes there's a tie. Like you'll have two numbers that both occur three times. Yeah. But then if that happens, the guy that only occurred twice, the number that only occurred twice, he's no longer even in the running for being the mode, if you understand what I mean. Yes, ma'am. And yeah, I, I, had to, I had to do the test like three times over just to make sure I get it right. Uh, well, just possible that you didn't understand that one concept. I'll just, uh, I'll give you an example of it again, and maybe we can see if that's, you know, really. <clears throat> I, I understood. I was just not understanding why it was saying the second, the the one that had like two, uh -huh. you know, two numbers versus the three numbers. So I just did it over again because I thought it was just playing with me. No, it's just, it's just because an occurrence of three times is more than an occurrence of only twice. Yeah. So let's say they were given a prize to the lady that showed up the most at this particular workout club. And let's say Jane was the, the lady that showed up the most times. They're not going to give a prize also to Sarah who only showed up twice. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like whoever occurs the most or shows up the most, that's the winner. Okay. And the other one doesn't even get a prize at all. No prize for being mode if you are not the most often occurring number in the set. Excuse me. Okay. I got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So today, and you can always, you know, come by during my office hours, you, you guys. Oh, I wanted to show you something also. Let me switch over here. Because I don't know if the, the guy that did the presentation for the tutoring lab <clears throat> showed you this or not. So I'm going to share. Let me get in here. Blackboard. This is. OK, this is your class. <clears throat> Chrome tab. Okay, so here's your Blackboard shell. I wanted you to see, because several of you have been showing up and um, when I have my office hours, because every single time, I have office hours every day. Thursday and Wednesday are when I have the most office hours, but um, Every day I have them and I always send out an announcement saying, hey, I'm online, I'm live. Like this morning I was online live helping people with different things. And you just show up and you can ask me whatever you want, any kind of questions you want. But if there's ever a time, like on the weekends, I don't do office hours. Um, and Friday I don't do office hours because we have all our, our meetings on that day. So I'm usually in meetings all day. Um, and you're not with me and you want to get tutored. I did provide two other ways for you to get tutored. Like for instance, see where it says academic support center. You just click on that. <clears throat> and if you scroll down a little bit on this page, you'll see that, um, there's all these people that are scheduled. See where it says, I'm just scrolling down. See where it says virtual tutoring for mathematics? And these things that you see in blue, those are the tutors. And many of these people were instructors here for many years, like Dr. Maxwell. He was the dean. He was a mathematics instructor for tons of years. Most of these people have taught everything from basic math all the way to calculus and beyond. So they're great people to get help with. And all you have to do is like, for instance, right now, what time frame are we in? <clears throat> um, let's see, it's Monday. Dr. Maxwell is on shift. And if you click on this link, he's going to answer. He is sitting there waiting for people to um, approach him to get help. I mean, let's see what happens when you click on it. 9 a.m. to 12, so he should still be there.
Hello, Dr. Maxwell. Okay, now you see that somebody has already popped in and they can see that I am saying something. And they're going to join me in a minute or two. I'll wait until they pop in just to tell them that we're just checking in to see how easy it is to get tutoring. Hi. I am great. I just, um, you know, I loved what you guys were doing in the in the um, faculty department meeting the other day, and I just wanted to show my Mat 1100 students how easy it is. So you'll probably see me doing this several times this week. Several times this week. I just want to pop in and just show them how easy it is to make them comfortable with um, getting help this way. Okay. Oh, that's all right. Um, okay. Do I, have, do I have to stop doing what I'm doing with you right now? Uh, 
Okay, hopefully everybody can see what I'm doing right now, but um, I think this has to stop sharing though. It says you're sharing an application. Doesn't that have to stop before I share something else? Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, okay. All right, so. Yeah, so if you are um, sharing, I think I may have shown them this before. You just um, go down. You know that the first icon is a chat icon. If I push on the next icon, it tells me who's attending. And then the third icon over down at the bottom of the screen looks like a little arrow off to the right. You click on that and then you choose one of the options. The first one says share your whiteboard. You can share um, an application and a screen like this. And you can either share your entire screen, something that you are, um, you know, a site, a website that you already have pulled up and you want to share with others to discuss it. Or you may have a specific tab that you have opened up and you can share like that by just clicking on the actual, you know, tab that you want to be on. Like right now, I'm sharing the ASC Collaborate tab with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to show them that um, all you had to do is go to the, icon, the ASC icon and then just click on the person who's working that shift and that you would answer very quickly. So thank you. Okay, take care. Have a great day. Okay, so I don't know if you could also see what he was doing, but mainly the whole point of me doing that just now, I mean, I can see your comments here in the comment board, but main, mainly what I wanted to show you is that all you have to do, once again, is this. It's so simple. They make it so simple for you to go and get help. Just right now, I'm sharing my your Blackboard shell with you. You know what's in your Blackboard shell, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. Now, hopefully right now you should see, and let me stop sharing this. Hold on for one second. I'm going to start again. <clears throat> so anyway, just to go over those steps again, all you do is um, go right here. Oops, I got rid of your, got rid of my blackboard shell. Hold on. So you have to have the window pulled up that you want to show somebody, and I just closed it because I wanted to start over again. But let me pull it back up again. So I'm going to open up your blackboard shell so that I can review those steps again. <clears throat>
Okay, so let's see. Share, share. Pick the tab. I'm going to pick a Chrome tab. I opened up your Blackboard shell. I push share. And there you are in your Blackboard shell. I, I, I mean, the only reason that I did this is because I just wanted to show you that I already set you up to go directly into tutoring. You do literally nothing more than push Academic Support Center and scroll to the bottom of the page. And hopefully you can see what I am now talking about. You can put a comment in the comment box if you can't. You should be seeing this right now where I am hovering over Dr. Jack Maxwell's name. He is the one that is on shift right now. You just simply click on that name and within a minute or two, you're gonna hear him speaking. And like he said, like he said, they're just gonna simply ask you for your information because they're required to keep track of how many people they tutor. And then they'll start tutoring you. And you guys will, you know, Throw your ideas out there, what your troubles are, what you know, what you're having a hard time with, and you'll get a whole tutoring session. Okay, the other thing that I wanted to show you is this. Let me share your screen the screen again. Okay, right now you should be seeing your Blackboard shell once again. That's what I am sharing with you. And I wanted you to see that I set you up with another tutoring. Yes, th these people are only open till 9 p.m. and that's a lot of hours. But these people are open 24 seven. I made the titles on these little icons as self-explanatory as I could possibly make them. Free tutoring 24 seven. You click on that, you start a session with a tutor. So there's all kinds of ways that the college is paying for in order for you to have free tutoring. Because tutoring when you pay is at the college level is $40 to $50 an hour. So please take advantage of all these free resources that you can obtain while sitting in your home. <clears throat> all right, now let's go to the material. Um, unless anybody has any questions for me regarding that, those things that I wanted to share for you, I don't want you to feel intimidated about getting help. And don't forget, you can attend any of my tutoring sessions. Whenever I'm having office hours and I send out an email that says, which I always do, every time I have office hours, I send out an email saying, I am online and I am now available for questions. And I post it on your announcement board in your Blackboard shell and I email it to your River Mail. So you could use that as well. Um, okay, so let's see. Now, let's. I'm going to go to sharing my camera so we can get through this material. Jump in. Feel free to jump in if I don't explain something to your satisfaction. I didn't feel like the lessons note packet had enough examples, so I pulled out my own examples. This is the very first page of the lessons note packet. And all um, um, this lesson's note packet, you know, it just comes with a book and it kind of hits on the main ideas. But I don't always pull my own um, problems in there, either from the book or from a worksheet or something. So you have more practice because a lot of times these lessons note packets are only one or two pages. So I just wanted to remind you that whenever you are finding area, you're finding all of this inside portion. All of these figures are flat figures. They are two dimensional. Every single time you go to find area, it is a two dimensional concept. I'm going to, I'm going to explain what that means when I do the problems. It really means um, that your units are going to be to the second degree. That's what two dimensional means. Volume, on the other hand, is a hollow object that you could fill up with water or air, and that's considered three-dimensional. When you can fill something up like a fish tank, that is a rectangular um, cube, and you can—it's a rectangular solid. It's called, even though the top is missing, 
and you fill it up with water. So there are three, that's a three dimensional concept. So I'm going to put here, this is in your, it's the first page of your lessons note packet. So again, when I say it's three dimensional, it, it means that in your answer, it will be inches cubed. If the unit in the answer is feet, it'll be feet cubed. If it's um, whatever, centimeters, it'll be centimeters cubed. It's a three-dimensional concept. Area, on the other hand, is a two-dimensional concept. There is, you can't fill these figures up with water or air or anything else. You don't have any kind of third dimension. But with regard to two-dimensional, that means if the problem has inches in it, it'll be inches squared, two-dimensional. If it has feet in it, it'll be feet squared and so forth. Whatever the unit is, there'll be a two on it. I want to remind you how to use the formula. Some of you have been a little bit challenged by using formulas, which um, I saw a little bit of when you were trying to use that compound interest formula. The formula is kind of like a recipe card that tells you what to do, when to multiply, when to raise to a power. So every time you're doing the sort of problem that has a formula, you must write the formula first. Then you're going to show how you're plugging numbers in for the variables. Then you're going to do the mathematical operation in your calculator. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate that here. I'm going to be using a different one of these formulas. Here's all the formulas for area coming right down the middle. But as I do the problems, I'll continue to write the formulas. Notice that in different books, like for instance, in this picture right here, they're saying that this side is called L. So they're saying when you do the area of a square, it's just whatever the side is called, which they called it L, and you square it. So if I call this side A, it's A squared. If I call it B, it's B squared. So these are generic formulas. Um, most often when there's a base and a height, they will use B and H. That's really, really common. Like for a rectangle, you could either say area is base times height, or you could say that it's length times width. So these variables are arbitrary. You could use different variables if you want, but the formula will always be the same. It's just that different letters might be used. Perimeter. I don't know that you really need to um, memorize any kind of formulas or write them on your card for perimeter. Not if the thing has um, straight sides like this, because you can just add up the sides. That is the generic formula um, for anything with sides. Perimeter is just add up all the sides. I think most of you know that. However, once the sides are no longer um, segments, these are called segments. That's a segment, that's a segment, a straight segment. Once those segments become rounded, then you need a formula. Because perimeter means that you're going around all the edges and adding them up. But you can't do that here because you don't have distinct edges. You have what's called the circumference, and that takes the place of perimeter. That's the diameter, that's the radius. And they have two, you know, they have two form, they have a formula here. There's two different ways to do circumference. Really, you know, of course they get you the same answer because just because there's two ways to do something doesn't mean that you get a different answer each time. You have to get the same answer. So you can either go radius times two and then multiply by pi. All calculators have a pi symbol on it. And you will use that pi symbol. Um, when you have um, a number up against the pi symbol, up against an R, and you don't see any plus or minus signs in between these terms, remember that that means multiplication. Like, for instance, this says 2 times pi times R. So you would press in your calculator 2 times, hit the pi symbol, times whatever the radius is. It'll be a number. Or if you want, you can go, you can use this formula. This formula is equivalent to this because two times the radius is that D that you're seeing there called the diameter. There are also all these volume formulas. And I'm going to demonstrate these as well. Like if you want to do the volume of a cube, 
a cube has all sides equal. This is equal to this is equal to this. Every edge has an equal length. So you just take whatever that edge is, raise it to the third power. Um, if you want to do the volume of a sphere, you're going to you're going to press it in your calculator like this. I know that's written a little bit weird, but you're going to write it like this. Let me get in this box up here. Volume would be equal to four. See that four is on the top. All of these things are on the top. I think it's better if you look at it like this. It would be four times pi times radius cubed. And then you see how this four thirds right here is divided by three. So that three is a divisor. I would do all of that first in your calculator. And then the last thing I would do would be divide by three. I think that'll be easier for you to enter. This is the same thing as what you're seeing here. Just, just here they use the slanty line. Okay, same thing for this one. That has it written like this. It's one, that's a top, this is a top, this is a top. So when you go to do volume, it is for a pyramid. It's one times, and of course you don't have to put the one, times base times height. You enter all the things in your calculator that are considered to be in the top of this expression. The only thing that's a divisor is are numbers that are underneath this a fraction bar. They are divisors. So you would go this times this times this, that number would be in your window, then you would push the division sign, and then tell your calculator what you're dividing by. So any of these things that have this slanty fraction at the top, I mean in the front, just use that top number, the numerator, times the rest of the items. 1 times pi times r squared times h. And then this divisor, that is what you're dividing this entire answer up here by. So that would that'd be the way to actually press it in the calculator. And again, you don't need to press in the one times. You can just start right here. All of this is being multiplied. Pi times r squared times h. That's what it means for terms to be right up against each other. So trying this, using a different formula each time I work with it, I pulled some problems for you. I'm going to try them. Okay, each time I do a problem, I'll write the formula down and you can work them along with me. This is just a square. I'm going to do the formula as well as the actual problem. I put some numbers here for you. So the area here, they have all the formulas down at the bottom here, so I'll just use the way they have it here. It says area is side squared. They were trying to get you to match the formulas with the shape, but I'll match them for you and give it as examples. So your area here would be five squared. Be very aware of where your power key is, because not only did you need it for compound interest, but you also need it for many of the area and volume problems. So that does not mean two times five. You need your power key, or maybe you're doing that in your head. Oh, and by the way, I should be very clear here. that when you go to square, not only are you squaring the five, but also the units. Because I did, just did make a point about things being two-dimensional with respect to the units. So you can get your calculator to do, to do this part, five squared. You just put in your calculator. So you gotta be aware of where your power key is. I pressed in five, my power key is right here, this little carrot key, and then I Dump the power there, and I get 25. So you can let your calculator do the numeric part, and then that square also applies to the units. As I said, area answers are two-dimensional. That means second degree on the units always. Do not put the square over here because it will be wrong. Then you're saying that your answer is 25 squared, which is 625 and is nowhere near what you have right now. Okay, so that's the final answer for that. Um, rectangle, instead of side squared, you're not just taking the same side and squaring it because the sides have different numbers. They're different lengths. 
So that formula is length times width. So here I would go 2.5 centimeters times 4 centimeters. I would get my calculator to help with the, the you know, the arithmetic part, 2.5 times 4. Two point four times five is ten, and then centimeters times centimeters. You're collecting up the powers when multiplying like bases. Those centimeters consider the bases. Add the powers. That's the uh, multiplication rule for exponents. You add up the exponents. So always, when doing an area answer, it will be two dimensional on the unit. Okay, moving to this next example. The next example is a um, triangle that has the formula area is one half base times height. Okay, so this is going to be one times base, which is two inches times the height, and the height is three inches. And then don't forget the formula says divided by two. So the area of that triangle ends up being six inches squared, inch times inches, inches squared, divided by two, or three inches squared. Running out of room here. Okay, that was the triangle problem. This was the rectangle this was the square so so far we've done a square a rectangle and a triangle what you're seeing as this fourth figure down that's called a rhombus and so for the formula for that it's a parallelogram and the formula for the area of a parallelogram is area is equal to one half it's still one half, this is one half base times height, P times Q. So I'm going to do the, let's see, I think I'll do this one right out here because I'm kind of running out of real estate here. So I'm going to do one half. So again, the one is the top, so it's top times whatever else is here. I know it, they make the way they write it, they make it look like the P times Q in the bottom but it is not part of the bottom so if you're confused as you're listening to me it's just this is the way that they commonly write it in books and students that get confused they say well god it looks like that's in the bottom it belong this is really means this that's another way to write what you're seeing it does not belong to the bottom it is part of the top all of this gets multiplied by the top so that's why I'm trying to make a point of that. So in this case, it would be 1 times P times Q. I'm going to write it again over here, over 2. And you don't have to write the 1, because multiplying by, of course, doesn't change anything. But you do need to write the P times Q. Again, when two letters are right up against each other, that indicates multiplication. So you could go, let's see, my P is 4 centimeters times, I'll put a little dot there, 1.75 centimeters divided by whatever the divisor is, which in this formula is a 2. Then you can get your calculator to assist you with the actual numbers. So you'll go 4 times 1.75, get the top, then divided by 2. And your answer is 3.5. All area are units to the second degree. Here's one of them, here's the other one. When multiplying centimeters times meters, you add up those powers. Keep the two on the unit, not on the number. Okay, so four examples, four different figures. Um, here's another picture of a parallelogram. Parallelograms have opposite sides parallel. So this pair of opposite sides are parallel, those um, opposite sides are parallel. So for this particular problem, 
Let me see what else do we have here. Got a trapezoid. Let me just check this out real quick. Okay, so this is just base times height area. So parallelogram base times height. So the base here is five centimeters. And the height, you can use this for multiplication or you can just use a dot, whatever you prefer. Okay, and that would just be 15 centimeters squared. One centimeter there, one centimeter there. I collected them together. Okay, so actually multiply out the numbers according to the formula and then add the powers on the units. Moving to this next shape, a right triangle. Okay, and again, for any triangle, whether it looks like this or whether it looks like this, it's one half base times height, just like I wrote right here. Okay, that was the formula there. Same thing here. Area is one half base times height. It's just that in this particular triangle, the height is one of the legs. These are called legs when it's a right triangle. When it's not a right, you know, a right triangle is something that has a right angle in it, 90 degree angle. That's what that little square represents. So when it's not a right triangle, the height will come right down the middle of the triangle. But when it is a right triangle, the height will actually be one of the legs. The leg that comes up and down like this will be the height. So it's one half. The base is this leg right here, and I'm telling you to use five inches for the base. Don't forget to carry those units with the numbers. And the height, I gave you a height of six inches. Okay, so you could go top times top times top. Everything is in the top is a multiplier that belongs to the top except for the two. That's because it's underneath the division bar. So if you went top times top, five times six, of course, times one would still be the same thing. Inches times inches, inches squared divided by two, you would end up getting 15 inches squared. And this is all for this problem right here. Okay, this trapezoid, I'm going to have to do it down here, running out of room. This is called a trapezoid. It looks almost like the roof of a house. These are called the bases. That's a base, and that's called a base. If you want to label that, you can. One base will be shorter than the other one. So when they give you the formula, Here's the formula down here for doing area. You're supposed to add up the bases, cut that in half, and then multiply by height. Now you can do all the multiplication first, which is what I'm going to do. And the last thing would be to divide by two. Again, when there's a slanted line used for a fraction, you can write it like this. It's this belongs to the top. This belongs to the top. This belongs to the top. So it is one times a plus b times height. All of those are multipliers that are part of the numerator, the top. And then the only thing you're doing with that too is dividing at the end. So you can write it like that. Okay, so in this particular problem, this trapezoid that I'm doing right now, I would go area is equal to 1 times the two bases added together, so says the formula. The bases are, let's see, I gave you A is 3 and B is 5. A is 3. Again, see how it says that in this formula, you add those bases together. Plus 5 inches. And then I'm supposed to multiply that by the height. And I gave you for this picture, height is equal to 4 inches. Oops. Let me move that over here a little bit. Should have done this on a different piece of paper. So this 1 times anything doesn't really matter. I'm going to let loose of that. Don't forget the bottom of this formula was division by 2. So I have... 
three plus five, that's eight inches on the top, that's inside the parentheses, times four inches, that's right next to it, divided by two. Let's keep going with that. Okay, so four times eight is 32 inches squared, then divided by two is 16 inches squared. Okay, and all of this was uh, area of the trapezoid. Only one that I haven't done thus far is this one where it's area of a circle. And the formula for that, I guess I'll do that down here. The formula for that is right here. Area of a circle is pi r squared. I just wanted to match up the formulas for you and do an example of each one because they just don't have enough of this in the book or in the lessons note packet. So, and you can even like put a little symbol here that reminds you what. Like I would probably do that when you're making a note card, I would put a little shape under each um, formula. Like for what you were doing right here, I would just make a little square here. I might make a little rectangle here. So, cause sometimes they don't draw the picture for, a lot of times they don't draw the picture for you. In the Socrative activity that I have that goes with this unit, I didn't draw the picture. I just say the length, it's, I tell you the name of the shape, and then you pick out the formula. Again, you get to use a note card. So you don't, it's not like you need to memorize all these formulas. Maybe when on your note card, when you write this formula, just drop a little picture next to it. So that will remind you what shape it is. And likewise for each of these formulas. Okay, maybe for this one here, you could just draw a little, par a little parallelogram that has the slanty parallel sides. And then it'll just remind you what you're about to calculate. So in this last problem, it's pi. I'm going to turn, I'm going to use the pi symbol in my calculator. And then I'm going to multiply by r squared. So let's see, what is r here? r in this particular problem was 4 meters. So I put the 4 meters in there and I square it. But when you're squaring um, an expression that has a number, and a unit, you have to square the number as well as the unit. So this is going to be pi times 4 squared, which is 16. If you don't know that, you can put it in your calculator. You just enter the 4, raise it up to the second degree to get the 16, if you don't know that it's 16. Okay, times, there's also meters squared. Now, um, you can press it in however you want to the calculator. Um, there is this issue on the test where sometimes the problem will say, give an exact answer. And then sometimes it'll say, give an approximate answer. I'm going to go ahead and do that for you now. Um, when you write an answer like this, you would typically write the number first, the symbol that stands for the a number right next to it, and then the units last. This is what we call an exact answer. You have not rounded it off to any extent. You would, in order for you to round it off, in order, you know, just to give an approximate answer, you'd have to press it in your calculator. You would then see decimals. So this would be an, what we call an approximate answer. It's close to the answer, but it's not exact like this one. This is called exact because I haven't rounded anything off. So if you want to round it off, let's say I say approximate to the tenths place. Then you got to put it in your calculator. You have to actually enter 16 times pi. So 16, I already, I still have the 16 in the window. If yours doesn't do that, you could just type it all over again. 16 times, hit the symbol with the pi key and press enter. Rounding to the tenths place, that would be this 2. That number would have to go up because the number next to it is 5 or bigger. So it would be 50.3 to the tenths place. And this is what we call an answer that's just close. It's approximate to the answer. Units still belong there. 
Okay, difference between an approximate answer and an exact answer. You will be asked for both kind of answers, I think, on the circle problems. Okay, let's look in the lessons note packet. I don't think we're going to have time for the activity because we were talking to the tutoring place, but that's okay. I'd rather you know where tutoring is. Okay, let me stop here. Does anybody have a question that they want to throw out there regarding the material that I'm doing? Okay. All right. Brain overload. Sorry about that, Lewis. I would just feel lucky if I was you that you get to write the formulas down. You're not even required to memorize them. And then you just follow them like a recipe. That's kind of the gist of the whole section. Like, for instance, for this one, um, make sure you use the correct units on your answers. I'm asking you to do, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here's the questions down here. Find the area and the circumference. So all you have to do is, number one, pull out a formula for area. And if you have it written on a note card, that's not going to be very hard. You're just going to look at your note card and you should have it like this. And maybe if you don't want to draw the picture, you can just hang a little circle here, pi times r squared. Write the formula down and follow what it says to do. This is what you are being told to do. This is just the name of the formula. So you're going to go pi. You're going to take the radius and square it. The radius is 4 millimeters. So you just dump in the 4 millimeters. Okay, now this is what we call an exact answer. I'm just going to write it a little bit more nicely. Usually the number will be written first. Don't forget to square it like the formula says. So that will give you 16 times pi. We use, again, we usually write the number that results from squaring here, which is 16, then the pi will, and then the units. So it's millimeters squared. Okay, so the exact area 16 pi millimeters squared. I think that's right from the test, from the, te the Alex test. Circumference, there's a different formula for that. Okay, go back to the formula sheet, and I can post this for, oh, it's part of the lessons note packet, so it's already posted in your Blackboard shell. This gives you every formula you could want. Circumference, that's why it's called big C. Again, this is the name of the function. This is how you get the answer. A little recipe to follow. You can either use this or you can use this. Because sometimes in the picture they'll give you the diameter, so maybe this one would be more convenient to use. Sometimes they'll give you the radius, and therefore this would be more convenient to use. So let me see. In this particular picture, radius is given. So for circumference of a circle, I just got the formula off the formula sheet, which is 2 times pi times r. This says multiply those three things. So 2 times pi times r for millimeters. Now, circumference is like perimeter. You don't have square units. That's only for area that you that is two-dimensional. Circumference is where you're going around the edges, just as, as if you were doing perimeter. So the units are one-dimensional, not two-dimensional. That's area. So this would be 2 times 4, 8 with a pi symbol hanging off the back and the units being mentioned last. So the exact answer for circumference, 8 pi millimeters. Okay, then in the next box it says, now give us an approximate area. And you can go right off of the answers that you've already gotten. 
Okay, give us an approximate area, and then we're also going to do the approximate circumference. So what does approximate mean? It means put it in your calculator. So you're going to enter in your calculator 16 times pi. At which point you will get decimals. And then you can round it off to whatever they tell you to round it off to. If they did tell you to round it off, it says... Blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay, here it is right here. Round off to the nearest hundredth. That's two numbers after the decimal. So let's look at that again. It was 50.26. We want to cut it off right there and either leave this as a six or round it up. We need to round that up because of the number next to it. So 50.27. And since it's area, it's units squared. Area being a two-dimensional concept. Approximate the circumference. Again, approximate just means put it in your calculator. And then round it off to whatever. Put it in the calculator and round. And you go right off of that exact answer. That's what you enter in your calculator. 8 times pi. So 8 times pi, and you get 25. They said round it to the hundredths place, 0.13. So 25.13, use the units in the same manner as you reported the units for circumference up here, just millimeters, not with a square on it. Okay, this was from the lessons note packet. In the lessons note packet, I gave you all the formulas and I pulled out this problem because a lot of students, um, they just don't understand what the word approximate means, but it literally means nothing more than put this in your calculator now. So here you, with an exact answer, you give the answer with the pi. You don't really need to touch your calculator unless you need it for that, four squared, then you can use it for that. But don't press the pi symbol in there. Just let it hang. It'll just be listed second. The number, pi symbol, and then the units. Okay, let's go to volume. There is a volume problem down here, but I will practice all the volume problems with you first. Again, these are the formulas. Each time I go to do a problem, I'll just look at the word, what it's called, or maybe there'll be a picture with it and I'll use the formula that goes with it. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite each formula for you and do the problem that goes with it. Here's some problems that I pulled so that you could practice. Okay, so the very first thing you see um, is a cylinder. And again, in the lessons note packet, I gave you all the formulas. So cylinder is pi times r squared times h. So always write the formula first so you can get um, focused with respect to what you're trying to calculate. And if I was putting this on a formula sheet, I would just probably try to Copy this picture. That way you'll be able to pick it out whether they give you a picture or not. Okay, and then do what it says over here. This is just the name of it. This is the action that you're supposed to take. You're supposed to go pi times r squared. And then the r squared is what? Let's see, the r is, now they called it a. When you go from the center out to the edge of a circle, that's always the radius, regardless of what letter they use to name it. And then the height, they called it B instead of H, and it's 53 meters. See, this is why you have to take notes, because you're not going to get the, I don't know if you're going to get all of this in Alex. You'll get some of the examples, but not all of them. Now, this particular problem says 
instead of pressing the pi symbol, they want you to use 3.14. So pay attention to what they say in the problem. If they don't say use 3.14, then you can press the pi symbol. So it says use 3.14 where there's a pi. Uh, this 5 squared, put it in your calculator if you want. 5 squared is 25. You're also squaring the units. And then you're multiplying by 53 meters. Now go to your calculator. It, this says round to the nearest tenth. So you're going to go. Three point one four, just because they told me to use that up above in the directions, times twenty five times fifty three. And then, as far as the units go, volume is a three dimensional concept. In other words, it will always be whatever the units are in the problem raised to the third degree. That's what it means for an answer to be three-dimensional. So look, there's two of them right there, and here's another one right here. So it's meters cubed. Okay, moving to this next one. Okay, this is what's called a rectangular solid. This one's called a cylinder. But I mean, you have the pictures on your formula sheet with the names next to it, so I don't know that I really need to be writing the names, but I'll mention them at least. See, that's a cylinder, the one we just did. Now we're doing this one, a rectangular solid, you could call it, or a rectangular prism. You want to do the volume? It's just side times side times side. That's what this formula says. Take the three sides, whatever they happen to be called, but most commonly, you're going to have numbers on them. So it's just telling you take the three sides and multiply the three sides together as well as the unit. So when I go to do this problem right here, it is volume of this rectangular prism is side times side times side. And not only are these numbers getting multiplied, which your calculator will help you with, but the units are being multiplied. It's centimeters to the first degree times centimeters to the first degree times centimeters to the first degree. So your volume is going to be, let me put the numbers in the calculator, 80 times 46 times 52. And I get 191360. And it's centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. When you're multiplying like bases, you add the powers. So again, three-dimensional concept. Okay, that's a rectangular prism. Um, I already did a cylinder, so I think I'll move to another shape. This is called a cone. And it is upside down, but it doesn't matter. What you see right here, even though they called it B, that's the height. What you see right here, that's a radius. Because you see this is a circle, right? When you put, um, when you put a cone uh, right side up, it'll be resting on a circular base. And this is the radius of the base. They just happen to call it uh, A instead of R, but it's really the radius. Anytime you're going from the center of a circle out to the edge, it's the radius. And whenever you're measuring how tall the cone is, that is known as height. So don't be thrown off by the fact that they're not using H and R in every single formula. So if you look at the lessons note um, formula, it just says that you're going to go 1 times pi times R squared times H divided by, look at that divisor. That's a divisor right there. We're going to divide by 3 in the end. Okay, so volume is 1, and you don't have to write these 1s because, of course, they're not going to change anything. 
um, copying the formula right off that formula sheet, pi times, oops, I want to be clear what I'm doing here, so let me write them up, times r squared times h. I would definitely start making a formula card for this chapter. Then don't forget, you're going to take that whole thing and divide by three, so says the formula. You don't need to put that in your calculator. They said use 3.14 for pi in this in the particular instructions for this problem. So I don't know why I did that. So let's do that. So volume is equal to, look, I'm following this, pi, here's my pi, times, and you can just put parentheses right next to each other to indicate multiplication. You could go r squared. What's my r? My r is this value right here, the a value, which is 6.2 inches. Formula says square that r. And then you're going to multiply by the h, which is the height, which they gave us 7.2 inches. And you can put this in the calculator just like you're seeing it. You're going to put a square on the 6.2. You have inches squared here and then another inch to the first degree, so you're going to have inches cubed. You want to put all this in the calculator at one time. It could be 3.14 times 6.2 squared times 7.2. Okay, so let me put that right here. 3.14 times 6.2 squared. I'm the parentheses for multiplication times. Or you can do it like this if you want to. It's up to you. If you don't want to use a parenthesis, 3.14, you can push the time symbol, then put in your 6.2 squared. And then times, and the last number was 7.2. And you'll get this big number. They said round to the tenths place in these problems, so it's going to be 869.1. The units were, there's inches squared here and then another inch down here, so inches cubed, as all volume answers are, raised to the third degree. Okay, let's see. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do, I only have five minutes left, is I wanted to do a, spe a sphere for you. There was one in the lessons note packet as well, but I guess I'll just do this one first. Maybe I'll get both of them done. Okay, so all you need to know um, to do the volume of a sphere is the radius, and that's because that's the only thing there is in the formula. Here is the formula. I'm taking it right off this formula sheet that I provided for you, which is 4 times pi times r cubed divided by 3. 4 times pi times r cubed divided by 3. So this would be 4. They said to use 3.14 in this particular worksheet. So I'm just following those directions. And then it's 22 feet cubed. Finally, after I get all that multiplied out, I'll divide by 3 as my very last step. So the volume here would be, let me press all this in, 3.14 and 22. Okay, so 4 times 3.14 times 22, but with a cube on it, so raised to the third power. So it's this times this times 22 raised to the third power. I'm going to let my calculator get that answer first. And then my last step will be dividing by 3, just as you see right here, division by 3. That gives me 44579.6. And then the units are feet cubed. 
try to pay attention to the units because I think they're going to mark it. They might mark it wrong in Alex if, um, if you're not paying attention to that. Okay, last problem here is one again about giving an exact answer versus an approximate answer. So I'll finish up with that. That way I did all my extra examples and the stuff in the lessons note packet. Consider the sphere. It's got a diameter of 11.6, but remember the formula is like this. It's four for um, a sphere. It's four times pi times the radius cubed divided by three. You need the radius, not the diameter. A diameter is twice as big as a radius, so just cut this in half, and you'll have the radius, which is what you need for this formula. So 11.6 um, divided by 2 is 5.8. Okay, now I'll do this problem. I'm going to do it down here. So it says give an approximate volume. And let's see if they say where to round it to. Round to the nearest hundredths place. Okay, so I'm going to go four. It does not say to use three. It says use pi, the actual pi symbol. So I'm going to put pi there and actually hit it on the calculator. Times r. My r was 5.8 units or millimeters. So exactly following the formula, four times pi, four times pi, times r cubed, divided by three. I'm going to put all the items on the top into the calculator first and get them all multiplied out. So it's four times using the exact pi symbol that is for me is right underneath my clear button, but it's in a different color as it often is on most calculators. So go grab that different color, orange, and then get the symbol. Uh, now I'm going to be multiplying by 5.8 cubed. So times 5.8, raise it to the third power, get that whole number on the top, which is 4 times 5 times 5.8 cubed. And then don't forget, divided by 3. And you get 817.3. 8, 1, but they said, I believe, multiply, I mean, round it to the hundredths place. So I guess I need to go out to two places, so 0.28. Okay, so that is it for today. Um, I will see you again on Wednesday. Look out for my announcements of when I am tutoring, and you're welcome to get help if you found any of this material. Um, confusing. Okay? Everybody have a beautiful day. You're welcome. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Amina. Have a great day. Take care, Alicia. Elijah. Elijah. It's got to be Elijah.